The number? 279. This evening. What's, what page? 279. Go ahead and turn to page 279. 279. Page 279, good to see you. This is an old, old song. We're old, old people. Jump right in there. <laughs> All right, do it, Kimmy. Right now, here we go. As I journey through the land. Singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary through the crimson flow. Many arrows pierced my soul, turned my thoughts aside. But my Lord goes, I blew it all. See him blow. There to sing for real, of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me live my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. On a second better, went in service for my Lord. Dark may be the night, but I'll cling more close to Him. He will give me light. Satan's snares may vex my soul. saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice oh and in valleys low I look toward the mountains high and leading in the fight with a tender hand outstretched toward the valley low guiding me I can see as I On his face, there to sing for them of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, all at last, ever to be joined. Now at last, when before me billows rise from the mighty deep, then my Lord directs my part, he does safely keep, and he leads me gently on. Sing it now. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing for real of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares on past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Let me back up and we'll try to do number one and not make a mess. I don't know if I'll ever get this thing down, Pat, but... All right? Are you ready? How about the ushers coming? We'll, we'll come for this evening's tithes and offerings. Has the Lord been good to you? Amen. Amen. Give us the Lord's blessed you. Everything will be taken care of. Here we go. As I turn through this land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow. Many arrows pierce my soul from without within. But my Lord leads me on. saving grace on the streets of glory let me live my voice airs on past all and last ever to rejoice amen we want to remember tonight got a call uh, pray for brother jack last he's at home and in a lot of pain so let's remember him and shirley lauer called me last night and uh sure. is going through a lot of procedures and uh, she she's really down so let's remember shirley she's in ohio now but let's remember her. Tonight's offering goes to Brother Greg Fallbush. We know Amen. Greg goes way back, works at our school, and a pastor for many years came, went to our church before he took over. And so everything you give tonight will go to uh, him, and uh, hope you'll give as the Lord leads. Brother John, would you pray for us tonight?
ask Brother Charlie to come up and he'll uh, introduce who's singing tonight for our kids. The only mistake that I've seen thus far is uh, we took the offering up for Greg before he preached. We, we may want it back. No, not really. <laughs> Just kidding. Love Greg to pieces. Hate to see him go. Hate to see him go, although he's going to a lot better job, a lot more responsibility. Well, it's a better job for him and in his career. In his career, I'm not talking about the work is better, the people are better. I'll shut up. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, anytime you get a promotion, it's a better job, no matter what it is. Yeah. Okie dokie then. Is Kevin back over here yet? Yeah. Did you get the CD up there for Emory? Okay. Emory, come on up. You're doing your solo, right? Oh, come on. Okay, next we're going to have that dynamic duet. Do what now? The trio first? Oh, okay. Going to do the trio first.
I hope you learned something from Jackson singing the high notes. I remember a few years back when Jimmy had a problem with it. <laughs> we won't go into that. Okay, the duet's going to sing for us now. These aren't
We're going to change gears just a little bit here. How many of you know what sword drill is? Okay. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get all three of our sword drill contestants up here on stage. And Brother Jimmy is coming down to be the MC. Where did he go? I guess he went the other way. He's coming down. He done the, uh, he was the MC at uh, Nationals, so he knows exactly what's going on. And uh, so we're going to do sword drill. And what they do, there are six different categories that they have to memorize. And it's probably 60 or 70 things that they have to know where it is in the Bible. And uh, like scripture searching, unfinished quotations, character drill, book drill, and topical drill, and then doctrinal drill. They just call out something, and these kids have to get to it. And who gets to it the fastest? Here you go. Whoever got, I was just killing time until Jimmy got here. Whoever gets to it the fastest gets 10 points and then 5 points and, and 1 point for everybody else, I think it is. Is that right? Something like that, yeah. Anyway, we got all three of them up here. And, and, and Brother Jimmy, we want to do at least one of each category. Okay. And I want all you guys to get your Bibles out and see if you can beat them. You ready? It's been a long time since I've done this, so. Thanks, Ronald. Attention. Salute. Draw swords. All right, scripture searching. Scripture searching. Judges 7 3. Judges 7 3. Charge. Gianni. Judges 7 3. Now therefore go to proclaim is the ears of the people saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And they and there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Judges seven three. Alright, so back. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, un uh, draw swords. Unfinished quotation. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee. Charge. Cadence. Judges 13, 4. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and... Drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Judges 13, 4. Yes. Step back. Draw swords. Character drill. Character drill. Paul. Paul. Charge. Jackson. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, sep se separated unto the gospel of God. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Yes, step back. All right, book drill. <clears throat> book drill. Acts. Acts. Charge. All right, Johnny. John, Acts, Romans. All right, step back. Draw swords. Topical drill. Topical drill. Trust. Trust. Charge. All right, Cadence. 3 John 1.14. But I trust I shall shortly see thee and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Third John 1 14. All right, step back. All right, draw swords. Doctrinal drill. Man is saved by confessing and believing. 
Man is saved by confessing and believing. Charge. All right, Jackson. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession yes, is made unto salvation. Amen. Romans 10, 9, and 10. All right, step back. Amen. And that's it in a nutshell. All right. I did notice one thing when he asked him the second, uh, the unfinished quotations. I saw about 12 or 14 Bibles just lay down on the chair. Everybody give up. So... <laughs> It, it's amazing what these kids can learn, and, and, and they'll remember it for all their life. And uh, when Pastor Will gets up here and he gives you the scriptures, I want to, don't, you don't have to say charge. They'll, they'll find them, hopefully. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Amen. Let's give Charlie a hand. Appreciate all the work they do. We are now going to randomly call six of you up here to come and do the exact same thing. Let's see. I thought 20 or 30 years from now, do you think instead of Bibles, they'll have iPads or phones zipping through it? I mean, I can see as, as it's going. Uh, that, that's what I was saying when he said, when I have you turn, it, it's kind of scary sometimes because I'll tell you to turn to a passage and I'll see a glow light up on your face from your iPad. And I had to get used to that after some point, but a lot of people are using that. Nothing wrong with it. I'm just, just saying that. But uh, we appreciate, Charlie. Our kids leave uh, this week. And uh, they'll be in uh, Louisville, Kentucky uh, next week competing and uh, singing and di different things. So you pray for them as they're traveling up and as they compete. And uh, our kids, they do a great job. And our coaches do a great job, and we appreciate them. Well, let's have Greg come up. Appreciate Greg being here tonight. Give him a hand as he comes to preach for us. All right. If you have your Bible with you or want to do your iPad, either one. John chapter 20. Today is my first official day preaching for Welch College. And uh, the church I just finished pastoring, a lot of them did use the iPads and the iPhones. And this morning I preached at Heaven Bound Free Will Baptist Church. And um, that's a church predominantly of elderly people. And uh, I forgot that it took, took them a long time to find the scripture. I was halfway through my sermon before they uh, uh, found it, so. but it is an honor to be here tonight, as Will said and Charlie tried to say, um, I have taken a position in Nashville. Uh, May the 1st, I, it was announced on May the 1st, and I resigned that morning from my church. I told Hoy on Friday before that that we were moving to Nashville, taking the position. A lot of tears have been cried. 22 years I've uh, been at the school here. Um, 17 of the 22 years at New Hope Free Will Baptist Church. The other ones were here at this church. And uh, it, was a, it was a decision that uh, we didn't make lightly. We prayed about it, but we felt like God was in it. Uh, Will knows this. For the last year and a half or so, we felt like God was moving us. We didn't know what He was doing. We um, uh, prayed about a position at a church in Kentucky, and God didn't move us there and at the time that I took this position we were praying about a position in a church in Alabama and I just didn't feel like going to a, a third world country so uh, uh, God didn't call me in the mission field yet so uh, I, I didn't take that one but uh, the problem I had was this uh, I've got every initial that you can imagine ADHD and A through Z and I, my mind just doesn't settle very well and the three areas of my life that I'm the happiest that don't fit well together is in the classroom, behind the pulpit, and on the basketball court. Coaching, not playing, coaching. And putting those together just, you know, here was a perfect situation for me. But I felt like God was moving us. And um, in late April, Dr. Penson from Welch called me one night. And when you're getting your master's through a college... And late at night, the president of the college calls you. That's not a good phone call that you want to get. You're like, did I do something wrong? And um, he talked to me for a while, and 
we prayed about it and we decided that's where we're going to go. And God is moving us to your college. And we are excited about it. You know very uh, well that it's your college. One of the board members is your pastor. He has been very supportive of me going up. But my position at the college is going to be unique. Um, I'm going up, as I said, as a, I'm going to be a teaching when I finish my master's in uh, January. And I'll be, uh, I'll be actually teaching the following year and uh, working as the athletic director and preaching. And I'm excited about that. And the reason that fits together, if you'll bear with me for just a second, is this. Why does it matter that the athletic director is going around preaching for your college? Well, let me tell you why that it matters. Whether you want to admit it or not, and it doesn't matter if we admit it or not, it's still true. Our denomination is on the decline. And we have to do something to change that direction. We have the right doctrine, so we need to fix that. And the problem that come in, comes into this with me is this. That right now, 52% of our high school graduates that graduate high school, that profess to be Christians, that profess to having a relationship with Jesus Christ, that goes to a secular university, 52% of them graduate and they, proc they proclaim that there is no God. 52% of them. Of the 48% that, that makes it through, and you take that 100% of the 48% of them, 63% of them say they are a Christian, they believe in God, but they do not believe in the total inherency of the Bible. So you say, why does it matter that your athletic director is going around preaching for your college? This is why. These young people that was up here today singing and everything, God has given them a talent. Any, anything that you, do for the, that, that you do for the Lord, God has given you a talent. But God also gives some young men and women in our free will Baptist churches some athletic talent. He has blessed them with that. And what happens is this. We send them to free will Baptist churches. We send them to free will Baptist camps. We send them to CTS. They do everything right, and they love athletics. And then if we're not careful, when they graduate high school, we say, now you got to choose. Do you want to go to a Christian college that teaches you about Christ, teaches you the importance of ministry, and still get to play athletics? Or do you want to go to athletics and not do that? And to be honest with you, that was where my conviction fell. Right now, Welch College, we have golf, cross country, volleyball, women's basketball and men's basketball. I'll be coaching the men's basketball team. We'll see if we have it in another year after I get finished with it in a year. But our plan is to start women and men's soccer and then baseball and then see where God leads us after that. But to do that, we need your help. Okay? Um, on August 1st, this is when it will be announced, we're starting an athletic capital campaign to improve the athletic department at Welch College. Um, our athletes are not on scholarship. Um, we have music ministry that goes out and travels. They're on scholarship. Our athletics are not on scholarship, and we're not going that route. But we do need to do some things to help our athletic department. We need two new buses, dramatically. And we need the colleges uh, said that I can start the men and women's soccer team, but I have to raise half the money, which is not unrealistic. And we're going to do that because I want our kids to have the same opportunity that other college students have. So I, I think it's important that the athletic director goes out and teaches and preaches about Christ to help our kids that can go out into the ministry. So tonight, the, uh, I've done my spill for the college. Uh, we, if you would, pray for me, pray for my family. Uh, they're excited. My son is seven. He thinks he's going to college. Uh, he, he's really excited. Uh, my daughter will be moving up with us. and uh, So we're, we're excited about the change, scared to death. But uh, we do covet your prayers. In John chapter 20 is a passage that God laid on my heart. I preached this message at our church on um, a couple years ago, three or four years ago at um, Easter. And, what, and it's funny about it is that um, uh, I started, when I started my master's, you had to do a sermon. And I turned this sermon in and I did it and some people in the class, you gave all the sermons 
to everybody in class. And if you don't know it yet, pastors are the biggest thieves out there. If there's a sermon, they're going to steal it, okay? And uh, a gentleman in my class that was in Georgia uh, emailed me and said, I like that message. I'm preaching at a community event tonight um, uh, with a different denominations and everything. I'd like to preach that message. I said, yeah, go ahead. And uh, here recently I found that message on YouTube, word for word from a Southern Baptist pastor in the same community that that gentleman preached in. So you can, if you didn't get to things tonight, you can go on YouTube, find the same uh, message that somebody preached. But I promise you I did preach this message first. Um, if, I, if I titled this message, it would be Thomas's testimony. Thomas's testimony. Uh, in, a, in a room full of people this size... I'm sure that I'm not the only one that struggles in my faith. Struggling, doubting God and, and when's God going to move and when God is going to do this. But as much as I struggle and as much as you struggle, none of us has ever been given the title throughout history as Doubting Greg. But Doubting Thomas. He gets the nickname and sticks with him and as Doubting Thomas. When you hear the name Thomas in the Bible, everyone in here goes to the title of Doubting. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that is a very fair assessment of Thomas. Because I find myself dealing with a lot of things that Thomas dealt with. So if you found John chapter 20, I've given you enough time to do that. If you haven't found it, just fake it. Uh, if you would, stand for reading God's Word, John chapter 20. We'll begin reading verse 19. Charlie Bochamp told me I had to preach quick. So I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, he just said amen. Has he ever said amen in church before? So uh, John chapter 20 verse 19 says this. Then the same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Before going further, let me, note, let me note, let you notice something real quick. Thomas is going to be going down in history as Doubting Thomas, right? Why doesn't the rest of the disciples not have a nickname of Scaredy Cat? Right? They're, they're locked up in a room because they're scared, but we don't, t we don't put that to them. But keep going looking at what happens with Thomas here. In verse 20 it says, And when he had said so, he, he showed him, them his hands and his side, and they were his disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Amen. Whosoever sins ye remit, ye are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, ye are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were with in, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, and doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and he said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither to thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust into my side, and be not faithful, faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, my God. Father, we love you. We thank you for everything that you do for us. Lord, we ask you that you be with us tonight. Lord, I invite you here. Lord, I need you. Uh, Lord, we ask you that you just help me remember the things I've studied. And Lord, we ask you to continue to bless this great church. In your name we pray. Amen. As I said, I believe that Thomas doesn't always get the uh, due that he deserves. And let me share this with you real quick before we go a little further with this, uh, is this. In Scripture, we have to understand that as these events are taking place, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, everybody, and Paul, they're not writing things down exactly when it happens. They wrote this down later. And a lot of this stuff is paraphrased. 
So what happens is this. We might not be privileged to every bit of the conversation. And if you put the pieces together here, you know that when Jesus appeared to the other disciples, he told them that you, you, know, you look at my scars to know that it's me. And then when Thomas uh, meets Jesus, when, before Thomas meets Jesus, he says, unless I see them, I will not believe. I cannot help but think there was not a conversation going on before this that the disciples said, I know that it was him because I saw the scars. And all we are recorded with is Thomas saying, well, until I see those scars, I'm not going to believe. So we tag Thomas as doubting Thomas. But I'm going to be honest with you. I don't believe that Thomas is any different than you and I. I go through my life and, and, and I doubt God at times and I doubt when God is going to move and I, and I pray and I ask Him to do things and He don't do it and, and I go through the same thing and I'm sure everybody in here goes through the same thing. And a lot of times, you know, when somebody's doubting or they're struggling, we think something's wrong with them. Muhammad Ali one time was on an airplane when he was boxing and, in, and if you knew everything about Muhammad Ali, he was a little arrogant. And he was in the airplane, he didn't have his seatbelt buckle. And a stewardess walked up to him and said, Mr. Ali, we, uh, if you would, could you please buckle your seatbelt? Muhammad Ali said, Superman don't need a, super, I mean a uh, seatbelt. And the stewardess said, and Superman don't need an airplane either. But you're in an airplane, buckle your seatbelt. See, there's none of us in here today that's Superman or Wonder Woman or anything like that. We, we're human and we go through life. And when flesh and we struggle and we doubt and we go through uh, pains and suffering in life. And just like Thomas, we struggle. And Thomas here, he gets tagged as a doubter. So what I thought it would be neat to do a couple years ago at New Hope, it, it was this right here. I believe it would be great if Thomas tonight got to give you his testimony. If Thomas got to tell you, hey, this is why that I doubted. And it might be the reason that you're struggling in your faith as well. So tonight, if it's, you bear with me for a moment, I would like for Thomas to give his testimony. He, he would start off by saying, my name is Thomas, and, and you might know me from the scriptures tonight. But I wonder if you really know me. If you've took time to consider the struggles that I've went through in life. I was honored to be one of the 12 disciples with Jesus. He handpicked me to walk with him on his journey here on earth. The greatest privilege I had in life was to spend the last three and a half years of his life in his ministry with him. You see, I, Thomas, was with him when he spoke Lazarus to get up from the dead. I was there. As a matter of fact, I was with Jesus when he walked on the water. I was with Jesus when he made the cripple walk again, the blind to see, and the deaf to hear. I, Thomas, was with Jesus through this time period. I was there for all of it. When the scripture says that the books could not contain the things that Jesus did, I can tell you some of those things. I got to witness them. I was with Jesus for three and a half years through every bit of it. I helped remove Lazarus' grave clothes when he uh, raised from the dead. I was there when Jesus fed the 5,000. I remember when they were hungry and Jesus told them that we was going to feed them. And I said, we, don't have, we told them that we didn't have enough. But I was one of the people that carried the leftover buckets to the boat. I was with Jesus through every bit of this. I watched Jesus take the bread and feed them. I, later that night, I was with Jesus when the storm came. And Jesus got out and, uh, from a nap and told the water to calm down and it stopped. I was there when it happened. I was with Jesus when he walked on water. I was with Jesus through every bit of this. And I do not understand why Jesus picked me. I am just Thomas. I am just like you. There is nothing special about me. As a matter of fact, if you read the scriptures, you will find out there is more negatives about me than positives. But he still picked me to be with him. He called me to walk with him. I follow Jesus with the best of my ability. And up until one night, you can find no problem in the scriptures with me doubting anything in Christ. As a matter of fact, if you study the scriptures up until that night, you would see that I followed him wholeheartedly with everything that I got. Let me give you some things about me that might help you understand why that I doubted. You see, I've been labeled as a doubter. And I'll be honest with you, labeling Christians is unfair because we always don't get the whole story. So tonight, let me give you three reasons of why I doubted that might help you and your faith as well. Number one, you have to understand this about me. I am a loyal person. I was born to be loyal. 
Let me explain this. The scripture three times calls me Didymus. Three times it calls me Didymus, which means ditto or repeat again. It means that I was the second born of twins. And in 2017, there has been enough research to tell you this right here, that the second born of twins is the most loyal of the two. That when we enter into a relationship, that we enter into it wholeheartedly. That when we enter in a relationship, we love unconditionally. When I enter into a relationship, I attach myself to them unconditionally. My loyalty runs true. I I fell in love with Jesus and I walked everywhere with him. For three and a half years, I showed him unconditional love. I stood by Jesus every time something happened. Remember when we went down to Bethany and where Mary and Martha lived and they run us out of town and they said this right here. If you come back in this town, we'll kill all of you. Do you remember a little bit later when Lazarus died in the city and Jesus wanted to go back and and, and we was going to face your death? Do you remember that I was one of the people that said, let's go. I was willing to die for Christ. Why was I willing to die for him? Because I was loyal. I was loyal to him. But understand this, as loyalty leads me to love and loyalty leads me to follow, it will also lead me to great depression. Because just as much as I love you, I expect to be loved in return. As loyal as I am to you, I would expect for you to be loyal to me. And one reason that I doubted, you see, was that night in the garden, I understood who Christ was. Remember, I already told you, I was with him through all of his miracles. I knew what he could do. And that was not only a dark night for everyone else in that world, that was a dark night for me when the soldiers come and my Savior, who I'd been loyal to, turned and freely walked away. I felt betrayed. And you might be here tonight and you could feel the same way. You could feel like I have been loyal to God. I have done everything you've asked me to do. Whatever you've wanted me to do, I have been faithful to do it. And now I'm facing a circumstance in my life and I need you to move and you are not moving quick enough, Lord. Or you're not behaving the way that I want you to behave. I have been loyal to you and I don't feel like you've been loyal to me. But see, what I didn't realize that night in the garden when Jesus freely walked away from him, he was being more loyal to me than I ever could have imagined. He was going to the cross to die for me. See, understand this. I thought that it was he was betraying me, but I didn't understand he was showing me great love. And sometimes in life when we need God to move on our behalf and we need God to do things in our life and he doesn't do it, we look at it as if he doesn't love us and doesn't care about us and it leads us to doubt and struggle in our life. Let me tell you something. Just because he's not moving and doing things right now the way you think he should does not mean that he's not loyal. It does not mean that he doesn't love you. As a matter of fact, it actually could mean the exact opposite. He loves you enough not to move on your behalf at this particular time. Do you know the greatest growth that we can ever have is through opposition? Do you know tonight that if you go, I'm going to jump back into 2017, I have Thomas here real quick. Tonight, if you go to New Zealand, do you know that only 42% of the birds can fly? Do you know why that only 42% of the birds can fly? Because there is no danger on that island to birds. There's no animals that will attack them. So they have no opposition, so they have no need to fly. And one of the reasons that God might not be moving in your life is that you need to have a little opposition in your life so that later on you can fly. So that later on that you can move and you can do things for Him. I didn't realize this until recently until I realized that I've got to start doing a lot more flying. Does anybody else have a problem with that? You go to a place and leave in something called a terminal. Does does anybody else have a problem with that? Then they use like final destination. That, that's not comforting. But I didn't realize that until recently. Do you know that when an airplane takes off, they want to go into the wind? Yeah. Going into the wind is what makes the, creates the lift. Yeah. So when God doesn't move when we want Him to, it is not because He's not loyal to us. It's not because He doesn't love us. It is the exact opposite. It's because He does love us. And and Thomas here, he didn't see this. So so Thomas here was loyal. Let me tell you something else about me as Thomas. This right here, not only am I loyal, I'm also very logical. 
Things have to make sense to me. Two plus two has to always equal four. It's not that I don't have faith, but it just has to make sense. And what I didn't realize that night in Christ, when in the garden is two plus two did not equal four. See, I understood that when Christ, I started understanding that Christ was the king and he was going to be lifted up and he was going to be in charge. I didn't fully understand that it was going to be on a cross. And logically, this didn't make sense that he was coming from heaven to be the king to die on the cross. Logically, this didn't make sense. So I struggled in my faith because logically, it doesn't make sense. And I'm telling you, tonight, you might be struggling in faith and doubting some things in God because it doesn't, just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that loved ones suffer. It doesn't make sense that you go through hard times. It doesn't make sense you trust in God and you're moving and you want everything to happen and God just doesn't seem to move on your behalf. Logically, that doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't have to make sense to you. It just has to make sense to God. I've been at this long enough to know that I don't want my way. I want His way. When I have my way, I mess it up. Have you ever, I might get in trouble for saying this, hope nobody works there. Have you ever been stopped at Macintosh at the McDonald's or, or Burger King right there? I got in trouble a couple of months ago in my car. My wife was with me and I stopped and I stopped at Burger King there and I just said, give me something. And they asked, what do you mean? I said, well, you're going to mess my order up anyway. Just give me what you want me to have. Their, their, their slogan is have it your way and no it's no it's have it their way and I have found out the hard way in life when I have it my way I mess it up when things have to make logical sense to me it's not going to work out right I'm, I'm going to be honest with you really quick jumping back into today's time is I've already told you this logically it doesn't make sense Charlie said that I'm moving into promotion. I'll let you know in a year. I, I just don't know. Logically, it doesn't make sense because I'm going to be honest with you. I loved working at Sefner Christian Academy. I loved pastoring New Hope Free Will Baptist Church. I had it made. And when it didn't make sense that God was moving us after being here 22 years, do you know that my wife and I were going to live here one year? We moved here, we're going to live here one year. 22 years later, listen, it doesn't make sense that a year before we move, we buy burial plots. That doesn't make sense. Logically, things in God doesn't make sense. And sometimes when we try to put human logic with it, we get depressed. And that's where Thomas was. He logically didn't make sense that the one he served, the one that raised Lazarus from the dead, was willing to go to the cross to die. So not only was he logical, not only was he loyal, but understand this, he took things literal. He took things literal. Thomas, he, he took things literal. He, listen to this. He, he, when Jesus said something, he took it the way he meant it. He was listening to Jesus when Jesus said certain things. Listen to this. Do you remember that when Jesus said, Where I go, you must go also? And watch this. Now he's walking to the cross. Where do you think I think I've got to go? I've got to die with him. When he wanted to go back to Lazarus and they, and they was thinking about dying, I thought I was going to have to go back with him to die. And when Jesus said this right here, that he must be lifted up, I took him literal that he was going to be a king. I didn't make sense to me that that was what was going to happen. And understand this, sometimes we misinterpret what God is saying in our life. And understand this, when he says no, we literally mean believe that it means never. But what I, Thomas, didn't understand this. I was struggling because I was loyal to him. Listen to this, it was logic, not logical and I took him literal. But what I didn't understand was this right here, he loved me. And watch this. When the disciples were in the, they were in the room and they were there and Jesus appeared to them, I was not there. Thomas was not there. But the second time, I was. If you read the scriptures, do you know who he pointed out? Me. Do you know why did he come to me? Because he knew that I was struggling. He knew that I was in a bad place. 
And he come to me and he said, Thomas, I know you're struggling. So here's what I want you. I want you to put your hands right here and I want you to feel this. Feel the scars. And that will give you encouragement. Recently, I, um, as I said, I resigned on May the 1st at church. And there was a young man, well I say young, he was in his 30s that I had invested in for, for the last couple of years. And I invested and invested and invested. And he just never could get it together. A couple of weeks ago, I got the phone call about 2 o'clock in the morning. He was killed in a car accident. Doing some things that he should not have been doing. He was at church the day before. I talked with him that day on the Sunday, and I, and I told him, you know, hey, you need to, to you know, commit your life to Christ again and, and quit playing around with this. And uh, you're faithful to church. You just need to give you everything to him. And I'll be honest with you. I was asked through the funeral, and I, and I struggled. I struggled with God. This doesn't make, this doesn't make sense that, Lord, I, I have been loyal, and it's not about me, and it's not really, but listen, Lord, I have been loyal to you. I witnessed to him. I spent time with him. Uh, listen, I even, me and him, went to Martha's restaurant down here many times to eat. I sacrificed for the Lord to go out to eat a lot with him. And, and you know, uh, I, I was loyal. I did all of these things, Lord, to try to witness to him. And, Lord, logically, this doesn't make sense. I believe he was so close, Lord, it doesn't logically make sense. That, that he was succumbed to this. And, and Lord, listen to this. Literally, it says this right here that it is not your will that any man shall perish. And here it happens, and this doesn't make sense to me. And let me tell you where God has given me some comfort. I'm not going to say any names. Garrett knows them. Pastor probably met him. I have a young man that I'm going to be coaching this year. And uh, this is a very unique man, he, uh, young man. He's very quiet, will not talk, um, always wears a hood on his head. And uh, I, I could not get him to communicate to me, with me. And I was struggling. I mean, I was struggling. Lord, I, I want to do your will, and I'm doing all of this, and now this happens here. And, and you know what? And, and if you've ever heard anything about Nashville, they don't have asking prices for houses now. They have a starting price. And we got bid for some seven houses. It was ridiculous. We were, I was going through a hard time. And one night, it was about two or three nights after the funeral, I was struggling, and this is what I was praying. I said, God, I need you to show me that you're real right now. And it wasn't five minutes later, that young man who had not responded to anything, I took him out to eat up there. I've, t I've spent with him personally. He would not talk. He texted me that night. He said, Coach, I just want you to know I appreciate the Bible verses you're sending me every day. He says, I'm looking forward to it. And, and I can tell you, Garrett knows who I'm talking about. For him to do that was big. You see, sometimes it's little things that God gives you to strengthen your faith. For Thomas, it was a scar. For me, it was a text. For you, I don't know what it will be. But he loves you enough to let you know that he loves you. And just like Thomas, don't be a doubter. Just trust and have faith. Lord, we love you and we thank you for everything that you do. Lord, we hope this message encouraged somebody tonight, Lord that could be struggling in faith. Lord, we ask you that you just work in our lives. Lord, we give you all the praise and honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You have a need tonight in your life. As Greg was preaching. Maybe you thought, yes, I am, I am there. I have something in my life that I don't understand it, but I need God to come through. You're here tonight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You want to be remembered in prayer. Would you just slip up your hand? By that same, pray for me. God knows the need. Bless those hands. God knows the need. I need. I need God to move in a certain area of my life. Maybe you're here tonight. You have a loved one, a friend, a relative who's unsaved. They need Jesus. You want to remember them in prayer. Would you slip up your hand? By that same, pray for my loved ones. God, we love you. We thank you for the message. Thank you for Greg. So many who raised their hands for different reasons. Lord, if any need to come tonight, I pray that they would. For
lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, if you need to pray, would you come? Page 410. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free. Brother Greg, a hand tonight. Appreciate the message. 